Scholastic Audio presents Captain Underpants and the Invasion of the Incredibly Naughty Cafeteria Ladies from Outer Space and the subsequent assault of the equally evil lunchroom zombie nerds. Hello, it's us again. Before you listen to this story, there's some stuff you need to know. So Harold and I have created this informative introduction to fill you in on the details. Please don't let this information fall into the wrong hands. George Beard and Harold Hutchins present a Deny Everything production. Captain Underpants, Wedgie Wars. Episode 1, The Phantom Principal. A long time ago, in an elementary school far, far away, there were two kids named George and Harold. We rule! Me too! They had an evil principal named Mr. Krupp, who was strong in the ways of the Force. Blah, blah! He forced them to study. Blah, blah, blah! He forced them to clean. Blah, blah, blah! And he forced them to behave. <laughs> so George and Harold hypnotized him. You will obey our every command. Okay. You are now Captain Underpants. Okay. <laughs> it started out as a joke, but it wasn't funny for long. <laughs> -la -la. Hey, come back! Mr. Krupp thought he really was the world's greatest superhero. He got into all kinds of trouble. George and Harold had to save him and the entire planet twice. twice. Now, the only way they can turn Captain Underpants back into Mr. Krupp is to pour water over his head. But the worst part is that George and Harold have to keep an eye on Mr. Krupp. Blah, blah, blah. Because for some strange reason, whenever he hears somebody snap their fingers, he turns back into you-know-who. So whatever you do, please don't snap your fingers around Mr. Krupp. You heard the man. Please, please, please don't snap those fingers. This has been a public service announcement from George and Harold who still deny everything. Treehouse Comics, Inc. <laughs> Chapter 1, George and Harold. This is George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. We rule! Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Me too! Remember that now. Hey, George, this book is about us! Um, Harold, can you stop interrupting the narrator? I'm trying to listen. Sorry. If you were looking for a few words to describe George and Harold, you might come up with kind, funny, smart, determined, and deep. Just ask their principal, Mr. Krupp. He'll tell you that George and Harold are kind of funny-looking, smart Alex who are determined to drive everybody off the deep end. But. Don't listen to him. George and Harold are actually very clever and good-hearted boys. Their only problem is that they're fourth graders. And at George and Harold's school, fourth graders are expected to sit still and pay attention for seven hours a day. George and Harold are just not very good at that. The only thing George and Harold are good at is being silly. Hey, Harold, look at the cafeteria menu sign. Today's lunch is new, tasty cheese and lentil pot pies. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, false advertising. Let's switch the letters around to something a little more truthful. There, today's lunch. Nasty toilet pee pee sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We still rule. Me too. Unfortunately, George and Harold's silliness gets them into trouble every now and then. Sometimes it gets them into a lot of trouble. And one time, it got them into so much trouble, it almost caused the entire Earth to be destroyed by an army of giant evil zombie nerds. But before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Chapter 2. The Evil Space Guys one dark, clear night in Pequa, Ohio, a flaming object was seen streaking across the quiet midnight sky. It shone brightly for a second or two, 
then fizzled out just above Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. Nobody gave it a second thought. The next day, everything seemed pretty normal. Nobody noticed anything different about the school. Nobody paid any attention to the roof. And of course, nobody looked up and said, Hey, what's that big spaceship thingy doing on the roof of the school? Perhaps if they had, the horrible ordeal that followed might never have happened. And you wouldn't be sitting here listening to me tell you about it right now. But they didn't. It did. And, well, here we are. Because, as we can all plainly hear, there was a spaceship on top of the building. And inside that spaceship were three of the most evil, hideous, and merciless spacemen ever to set foot on the roof of a small Midwestern elementary school. Their names were Zorks, Clax, and Jennifer. Their mission? To take over planet Earth. First, said Zorks, we must find a way to infiltrate the school. Then, said Clax, we will turn all the children into giant, super-powered, evil zombie nerds. Finally, said Jennifer, we will use them to take over the world. <laughs> Zorks and Clax <laughs> laughed and laughed. Silence, you fools, barked Jennifer. If our plan is to work, we must wait until it is narratively convenient. In the meantime, we will watch their every move on our trinocloscope. Chapter 3. Fun with Science Early that same morning, George and Harold were sitting in their 10.15 a.m. science class making silly noises. Meow! George mewed softly without moving his lips. <laughs> Growled Harold without opening his mouth. There it is again, exclaimed their science teacher, mystified. I distinctly heard a cat and a dog in here. We didn't hear anything, the children said, trying not to laugh. I, I must be hearing things again, Mr. Fide worried. Maybe you should leave and go see a doctor, said George with concern. I can't, said Mr. Fide. Today is the day of the big volcano experiment. The children all groaned. Mr. Fide's science experiments were usually the most idiotic things on Earth. They almost never worked and were always boring. But today's experiment was different. Mr. Fide brought in a large, fake-looking volcano that he had made out of paper mache. He filled the volcano with a box of ordinary baking soda. Baking soda is also called sodium bicarbonate, explained Mr. Fide. Meow. Um, said Mr. Fide, did any of you children just hear, um, uh, never mind. Mr. Fide opened up a bottle of clear liquid. Now watch what happens when I pour vinegar into the baking soda, he said. The children watched as the tiny volcano started to rumble. Soon, a large glob of foamy goop spurted out the top. The goop poured over the desk and dripped onto the floor, creating a huge mess. Oops, said Mr. Fide. I guess I used too much baking soda. George and Harold were stunned. How did you do that? asked Harold. Well, said Mr. Fide, the vinegar acts as a liberating agent, which releases the gaseous carbonate radical element of the sodium bicarbo- Meow. Um, uh. Mr. Fide paused. E Excuse me, children. I I've got to go and see a doctor. Mr. Fide put on his coat and hurried out the door. George and Harold got up and studied the messy volcano experiment with great interest. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? asked George. I think I'm thinking what you're thinking, said Harold. Chapter 4. The Setup After school, the two boys raced to George's house and got down to business. George and Harold sat down and began creating a bogus cupcake recipe. 
We'll just add a box of baking soda and a bottle of vinegar to this recipe, said George. And whoever makes these cupcakes will get a big surprise. Let's add two boxes of baking soda and two bottles of vinegar to the recipe, said Harold. That way, they'll get an even bigger surprise. Good idea, laughed George. Chapter 5 Mr. Krupp's Crispy Krupp Cakes The next morning at school, George and Harold strolled into the cafeteria and taped a festive-looking card to the kitchen door. Soon, the lunch ladies arrived. <laughs> oh, oh, look, said Miss Creant, the head lunch lady. Today is Mr. Krupp's birthday, and he'd like us to make a batch of cupcakes just for him. Isn't that cute? <laughs> I've got an idea, said the cook, Mrs. DePoint. Why don't we surprise him and make cupcakes for the whole school? <laughs> Good thinking, said Miss Creant. Let's see now. This recipe serves ten, and we have about a thousand students and faculty in the school, so... We'll need a hundred eggs, a hundred and fifty cups of flour, two hundred boxes of baking soda, seven quarts of green food coloring, fifty sticks of butter, a hundred and fifty cups of sugar, and let's see, ah, yes, two hundred bottles of vinegar. The lunch ladies scurried about, gathering everything they needed. They dumped the eggs, food coloring, milk, and baking soda into a large vat and began to mix thoroughly. Then somebody poured in the vinegar. Chapter 6. What Happened Next? Note, please turn the sound up nice and loud for this next part. Don't worry, you won't get in trouble. Chapter Six and a Half. Here Comes the Goop. A giant wave of green goop crashed through the cafeteria doors and splashed down the halls, swallowing everything in its path. Book bags, bulletin boards, lunch boxes, coat racks, trophy cases. Nothing could stand in the way of the gigantic green glob of goo. It traveled down the north, east, and west wings of the school dousing the drinking fountains, larruping the lockers, and battering the bulletin boards. The ginormously gelatinous, gooey glob gushed into the gym and splashed down the stairs. It billowed into bathrooms and persplooshed into the mouth of a narrator. <coughs> and it wasn't long before the green goop began spilling into all the classrooms. Uh-oh, said George. Something tells me the lunch ladies made more than just one batch of Mr. Krupp's Krispy Krupp cakes. But that was their idea, not ours, cried Harold. Speaking of ideas, said George, I've got a good one. What? asked Harold. Run! cried George. Chapter 7. The Wrath of the Cafeteria Ladies the next afternoon, as cleaning crews sorted through the sticky green hallways and sticky green classrooms, the cafeteria ladies had a meeting with Mr. Krupp in his sticky green office. But it wasn't even my birthday, cried Mr. Krupp. We know you had nothing to do with this, said Miss Creant. We think it was those two awful boys, George and Harold. Well, duh, said Mr. Krupp, rolling his eyes. Of course it was George and Harold. But do you have any proof? Proof? said the lunch ladies. Why, George and Harold are always playing tricks on us. Every day they change the letters around on our lunch sign. They put pepper in the napkin dispensers and unscrew the caps on the salt shakers. They start food fights. They go sledding on our lunch trays. They make everybody laugh so the milk squirts out their noses. And they're constantly creating these awful comic books about us! Chapter 8 Captain Underpants and the Night of the Living Lunch Ladies 
Captain Underpants and the Night of the Living Lunch Ladies. Story by George Beard. Pictures by Harold Hutchins. Late one Friday afternoon, the lunch ladies are cleaning up the cafeteria. There's lots of half-eaten food in this trash barrel. Well, pour it into the stew here and we'll serve it again next week. Waste not, want not. But while they were working, the janitor accidentally locked the school for the weekend. The lunch ladies were trapped inside. Help! They were forced to eat their own food to survive. Past the lips. Then over the gums. Look out, Tommy. Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> when the janitor returned on Monday morning, the lunch ladies were dead, victims of their own cooking. Oopsie daisies. The janitor took the dead lunch ladies up the hill to bury them. At the top of the hill, a sign next to an apple tree said, Bury dead stuff here. Hmm, that looks like a good place. But it wasn't. The apple tree was blocking part of the sign. What it really said was, warning, this hill is haunted. Whatever you do, don't bury dead stuff here. But it was too late. The thunder roared, the lightning flashed, and a living dead hand, clutching a spatula, burst from the lunch lady's grave. Meanwhile, back at the school, <gasps> The ladies arose from the dead. They're hungry for brains, and they just attacked the gym teacher. But I thought you said they were hungry for brains. This looks like a job for... What seems to be the problem? <laughs> Living dead lunch ladies. Don't worry, I'll give them wedgies. <laughs> oh no! Wedgie power doesn't work on the living dead. They got into a big fight. Captain Underpants was faster than a speeding waistband. More powerful than boxer shorts. <laughs> and able to leap tall buildings without getting a wedgie. But the lunch ladies were strong too. They ran faster than their runny meatloaf gravy. They were more powerful than the stench of their Sloppy Joe casserole. And they could leap tall buildings with the gassy after effects of their Texas style three bean chili con carne. Soon they were all on top of a tall building. We've got you now, waistband warrior. Not so fast. Captain Underpants pressed a button on his utility waistband. And out popped a roll of toilet paper. Even the living dead can't escape the toilet paper of justice. Captain Underpants lassoed the lecherous lunch ladies. <laughs> but they had a trick up their sleeves. A bottle of Lunch Lady brand Salisbury steak sauce! They poured the steak sauce on the toilet paper of justice. We're free! Let's get them, girls! Uh-oh! The Lunch Ladies leaped on to Captain Underpants. And together they toppled off the tall building. Oh! Captain Underpants tossed the toilet paper of justice. Up it went. It wrapped around the flagpole on top of City Hall. And he swung to safety. The lunch ladies weren't so lucky. Whoa. 
splat. Goosh. They landed in three trash pails and were splattered. The end. Treehouse Comics, Inc. Chapter 9. Quitting Time. We're fed up with those two boys, cried Miss Creant. They're always making fun of our cooking. Yeah, said Mrs. DePoint. Our food isn't that bad. I ate here once and hardly got sick at all. Well, I can't punish them if we don't have any proof, said Mr. Krupp. Fine, said the lunch ladies. Then, then we, we quit. quit. Ladies, ladies, cried Mr. Krupp. Be reasonable. You can't just quit on such short notice. But the lunch ladies didn't care. They marched right out of Mr. Krupp's sticky green office, and that was the end of that. Rats, cried Mr. Krupp. Now where am I going to find three new lunch ladies by tomorrow morning? Suddenly, there was a knock on Mr. Krupp's door. Three very large women wearing lots of makeup walked into his office. Hello, said the first woman. My name is, uh, Zorset. These are my, uh, sisters, Klaxet and, um, Jenniferette. We've come to apply for jobs as cafeteria ladies. Wow, said Mr. Krupp. Do you have any experience? No, said Klaxet. Do you have any credentials? Asked Mr. Krupp. No, said Zorkset. Do you have any references? Asked Mr. Krupp. No, said Jenniferette. You're hired, said Mr. Krupp. Wonderful, said Jenniferette. Now our plan to take over the world is, er, I mean, our plan to feed the children healthy, nutritional meals is underway. <laughs> the three new lunch ladies laughed horribly. <laughs> <laughs> then they left Mr. Krupp's office and got started preparing the next day's lunch menu. Well, that was easy, said Mr. Krupp. Now to take care of George and Harold. Chapter 10. Busted. George and Harold were in study hall when they heard the dreaded announcement over the intercom. George Beard and Harold Hutchins, please report to Mr. Krupp's office immediately. Oh no, cried Harold. We're busted. No way, said George. Remember, what happened yesterday was not our fault. We didn't do it. It was an accident. But Mr. Krupp was not as understanding. I can't prove it, but I know you boys are responsible for yesterday's disaster, Mr. Krupp said. I'm going to punish you by taking away your cafeteria privileges for the rest of the year. No more cafeteria food for you two. No more cafeteria food, whispered Harold. I thought he said he was going to punish us. Yeah, George smiled. Maybe if we're really bad, he'll take away our homework privileges, too. I heard that! Screamed Mr. Krupp. From now on, you boys are going to have to pack your own lunches and eat in my office so I can keep an eye on you. Rats, said Harold. But we didn't do it, George protested. We didn't do it. Too bad, bub, said Mr. Krupp. Boy, said George, this is probably the first time we've gotten in trouble for something we didn't do. Unless you count all those times we didn't do our homework, said Harold. Oh, yeah, laughed George. Chapter 11. Brown Baggin It The next day... George and Harold each brought their own sandwiches to Mr. Krupp's office for lunch. I'll trade you half of my peanut butter and gummy worm sandwich, said George, for half of your tuna salad with chocolate chips and miniature marshmallows sandwich, said Harold. You want some barbecue sauce on that? You kids are disgusting, Mr. Krupp shouted. Soon, George and Harold were munching on potato chips with whipped cream and chocolate sprinkles. 
Mr. Krupp was turning green. What's for dessert? asked Harold. Hard-boiled eggs dipped in hot fudge and Skittles, said George. Ah! screamed Mr. Krupp. I can't stand it anymore. He got up and stumbled out the door for some fresh air. You know, said George, now that Mr. Krupp is gone, we could run to the cafeteria and change the letters around on the lunch sign. Cool, said Harold. So George and Harold sneaked to the cafeteria. But when they read the lunch sign, they were a bit confused. What's going on here? said George. Today's lunch? Freeze-dried worm guts? Boston baked boogers? And zombie nerd milkshakes? It looks like somebody's already changed the sign, said Harold. Forget the sign, said George. Look at everybody. They've changed. It was true. All the kids and teachers in school were entering the cafeteria looking as normal as ever. But they were leaving the cafeteria looking quite different. Look, cried George. They're all wearing broken eyeglasses held together with masking tape. And they've all got vinyl pocket protectors. They've all turned into... Nerds, Harold gasped. And look at their skin, said George. They're all gray and clammy. That could only mean one thing. They're... They're zombie nerds? asked Harold. I'm afraid so, said George. Let's just hope they're friendly, said Harold. Who ever heard of a friendly zombie nerd? asked George. I'm afraid, Harold whined. There's no time to be afraid, said George. We've got to get to the bottom of this. That's what I'm afraid of, said Harold. Chapter 12. The Bottom of This George and Harold crawled into the cafeteria and sneaked through the kitchen doors. There, they hid behind a table while the incredibly naughty cafeteria ladies from outer space discussed their plans to take over the world. <laughs> Look at those puny earthlings, laughed Sorks. They're all drinking evil zombie nerd milkshakes and transforming before our very eyes. It won't be long now, said Clax. Tomorrow we'll feed them super evil rapid growth juice. Then they will grow to the size of zlip trees. Exactly, sneered Jennifer. Then we will unleash our giant evil zombie nerds upon the earth, and soon the planet will be ours. <laughs> <laughs> the three evil space guys threw back their heads and laughed hysterically. We've got to tell Mr. Krupp about this, Harold whispered. Right, whispered George. But first, we've got to get rid of that super evil rapid growth juice. George carefully reached up and swiped the carton of juice. What should we do with it? asked Harold. Let's pour it out the window, said George. That way it won't do any damage. Good idea, said Harold. While the naughty cafeteria ladies continued laughing, George quietly emptied the carton of super evil rapid growth juice out the window. The strange, glowing juice soaked into the ground, right next to a harmless-looking dandelion. You know, whispered Harold, Mr. Krupp is never going to believe that sinister cafeteria ladies from outer space have turned everybody into evil zombie nerds. Sure he'll believe us. He's got to believe us, said George. I hope he believes us. Chapter 13. He doesn't believe them. <laughs> That's the most ridiculous story I've ever heard. <laughs> Laughed Mr. Krupp. But it's true, cried Harold. Yeah, said George. Everybody in the entire school is an evil zombie nerd. The kids, the teachers, everybody. All right, said Mr. Krupp. I'll prove it to you. He pressed the button on his intercom and called for his secretary. Soon, Miss Anthrope entered the room. 
She was dressed in a pink polka dot polyester dress with orthopedic knee-high stockings and ugly brown arch support loafers. See, said Harold, she's dressed like a nerd. She always dresses like that, snapped Mr. Krupp. But she's gray and clammy and reeks of freakish zombified death, cried George. She always smells like that, Mr. Krupp argued. She's always gray and clammy, too. George and Harold had to admit that school secretaries were not very good subjects to compare and contrast with evil zombie nerds. But then, Miss Anthrope leaned over and took a huge bite out of Mr. Krupp's desk. Munch, munch. Must destroy Earth. She moaned as she took another bite. Munch, munch. Even Mr. Krupp had to agree that Miss Anthrope was acting a bit more evil than usual. So George and Harold took Mr. Krupp down to the cafeteria to confront the evil lunch ladies. Suddenly, out of the shadows stepped the evil Zorks. Gotcha! Zorks cried as he grabbed onto Harold's shoulders. Ah! Screamed Harold. He squirmed away, pulling Zorks' gloves off and revealing two slimy green tentacles. See, Mr. Krupp, said George. We told you they were space guys. You fools, screamed Zorks. Now we will destroy you. The evil Zorks pointed his tentacle at George, Harold, and Mr. Krupp and snapped his fingers. Snap. Suddenly... Mr. Krupp began to change. A heroic grin spread across Mr. Krupp's face. He threw out his chest and placed his fists firmly at his sides, looking quite triumphant. Uh-oh, said George. That evil space guy just snapped his fingers. Now Mr. Krupp is turning into you-know-who. Hey, wait a second, said Harold. Tentacles don't have fingers. You can't snap a tentacle. There's no time to argue the physical improbabilities of this story, said George. We've got to stop Mr. Krupp from changing into Captain Underpants before it's too late. Chapter 14. It's Too Late. Mr. Krupp turned and dashed out the door. His clothes flew off behind him as the hallways echoed with jubilant proclamations about the superiority of underwear. George and Harold dashed after him, but the door was quickly blocked by Zorks, Clax, and Jennifer. You want to get out of this kitchen? The evil Jennifer mocked. You gotta go through us! George grabbed a rolling pin. Harold grabbed a cast iron frying pan. I sure hope we don't have to resort to incredibly graphic violence, said Harold. Me too, said George. Chapter 15 the Incredibly Graphic Violence Chapter, Part 1. In, In Sound, sound oh, 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 Rama. Rama. Register trademark. Warning! The following chapter contains terribly inappropriate scenes that certainly do not belong in a children's book. If you are offended by such senselessness, please stop listening to this audiobook immediately. Raise your arms over your head and run screaming to your nearest shoe store. When you get there, ask them to make you a cheeseburger. Note, this probably won't help you a bit, but we think it will be funny. Lately, there have been many groundbreaking advances in the field of animation. There's claymation, dynamation, Japanese anime, and even computer animation. Well, forget all those. You won't see any of them here because you're listening to an audiobook. But if you ask us, Nothing beats the economy-sized thrills of cheesy sound effects technology, also known as... sound o -rama. Turn it up loud and enjoy. George pins a predator. Harold bonks a bad guy. Take this, you creepy alien. Oh. I'm not 
not afraid of you. Ouch! You're gonna need a dentist. George and Harold save the day! For now. You invaded the wrong planet, Bob. <laughs> get back in your spaceship and get out of here! <laughs> Chapter 16. The Assault of the Equally Evil Lunchroom Zombie Nerds George and Harold had barely caught their breath when Captain Underpants finally showed up. Tra-la-la! -la, he said. I'm here to fight for truth, justice, and all that is pre-shrunk and cottony. Where were you back in Chapter 15 when we needed you? Asked George. I was at the shoe store ordering a cheeseburger said Captain Underpants. While our three heroes were talking, nobody noticed that Zorks, Clax, and Jennifer had slithered away. The wounded space guys approached the lunchroom loudspeakers and called for their evil zombie nerds. Zombie nerds? instructed Jennifer. Destroy Captain Underpants and his little friends, too. Soon, every evil zombie nerd in the entire school put down their Omni magazines and headed for the cafeteria. Must, Must destroy, destroy underpants, they groaned. Must destroy underpants. Must destroy underpants. Suddenly, our three heroes were surrounded by evil, vicious zombie nerds. Closer and closer they came. Oh no! cried George. What do we do now? To the underwear cave, shouted Captain Underpants. There is no underwear cave, said Harold. Really? said Captain Underpants. Well, let's just climb up that ladder instead. George, Harold, and Captain Underpants scurried up the ladder, and soon they were all on the roof. Well, we're safe now, said Harold. Yep said George. That's for sure, said Captain Underpants. Chapter 17 Oh yeah? It didn't take long before George, Harold, and Captain Underpants looked behind them. Hey, said Harold, what's that big spaceship thingy doing on the roof of the school? And where did that super evil rapidly growing dandelion come from? asked Captain Underpants. George and Harold gasped. They looked at each other with the sudden, panicked realization that only children who have accidentally created a giant, mutated garden nuisance would know. Uh, uh, stammered George. We have no idea how that happened. Uh, uh, yeah, said Harold. Absolutely no idea at all. At that moment, the door to the roof swung open. Zorks poked his evil head out and shouted, We've got you now! With no place else to run, our three heroes quickly scurried up the ladder of the big spaceship thingy and closed the door behind them. Inside the spaceship, George, Harold, and Captain Underpants discovered a refrigerator filled with strange juices. Look, said George, here's a carton of anti-evil zombie nerd juice. How convenient! And look at this! said Harold. A carton of ultra-nasty self-destruct juice. Now this could come in handy. And look what I've found, said Captain Underpants. A whole carton of extra-strength superpower juice. Hey, give me that, said George, snapping the carton out of Captain Underpants's hands. Chapter 18. Space Slaves. Suddenly, the door of the spaceship swung open, and the three evil space guys slithered inside. Step away from the refrigerator, screamed Jennifer, and get into that jail cell. George and Harold hid their juice cartons behind their backs, 
and our three heroes stepped quickly into the jail cell. Zork started up the engines and the spaceship lifted off. It rose a few hundred feet in the air and hovered over the school. You three puny earthlings are very fortunate, said Jennifer. You will get to witness the destruction of your planet from the safety of your jail cell. Afterwards, you will have the honor of being our obedient space slaves. Oh, man, said George and Harold. Quickly, Clax, said Jennifer. Get me a carton of super evil rapid growth juice from the refrigerator. We can pour it into our spray gun and shower it upon our evil zombie nerds. Chapter 19 The Big Switcheroo Clax returned with a carton of super evil rapid growth juice and placed it on the control panel. Soon, said Jennifer, Earth will be ours! <laughs> 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 the three aliens threw back their heads and laughed and laughed. Suddenly, George got an idea. He whispered to Harold for a second or two, then he quietly reached through the bars of the jail cell and swiped Clax's carton of super evil rapid growth juice. George carefully peeled the label off the carton and stuck it over the label of his ultra-nasty self-destruct juice. While he was busy doing that, Harold reached through the bars and switched the labels of the spray gun and the fuel tank. Finally, George reached back through the bars and put his carton of ultra-nasty self-destruct juice, which now read Super Evil Rapid Growth Juice, on the control panel. I don't get it, whispered Captain Underpants. The fuel tank now says spray gun, and the spray gun now says fuel tank, and the rapid growth juice has been replaced with self-destruct juice. What's it all mean? You'll find out, said Harold, sadly. When the three evil space guys had finished laughing triumphantly, Jennifer reached for the carton that read super evil rapid growth juice and poured it into the nozzle that read spray gun. Oh, I get it, said Captain Underpants. That space guy didn't pour growth juice into the spray gun. He poured self-destruct juice into the fuel tank. Yep, said George sadly. And that means this spaceship thingy is going to explode into millions of pieces. Right, said Harold gloomily. The spaceship began to sputter and shake as smoke billowed out of the control panels. Soon, sparks were flying and ceiling tiles were falling. Captain Underpants smiled proudly because he had figured out George's plan. But his smile didn't last long. Hey, he cried. We're in the spaceship thingy. What's going to happen to us? We had to sacrifice ourselves to save the world, said George. I'm afraid we're not going to make it. Of course we'll make it cried Captain Underpants. We've got wedgie power on our side. Chapter 20, The Great Escape. Captain Underpants grabbed a roll of toilet paper from the jail cell lavatory. We can swing to safety on this, he said. You can't swing on toilet paper, said Harold. Sure I can, said Captain Underpants. I just did it in my last comic book. Captain Underpants opened the jail cell window and tossed the toilet paper into a tall tree below them. Come on, fellas, he said. Let's swing out of here before this spaceship explodes. That toilet paper won't hold you, said George. It's not strong enough. Sure it is, said Captain Underpants. It's two-ply. George and Harold grabbed Captain Underpants's cape. Don't, Don't jump, jump, they cried. But Captain Underpants wouldn't listen. He jumped out the window with George and Harold still clinging to his cape. Ah! They screamed as they fell to the ground and were killed instantly. Splat! Just kidding. <laughs> Of course, the toilet paper could not support the weight of our three heroes, and for a moment, it looked like they were doomed. But suddenly, 
Captain Underpants's red polyester cape opened up like a parachute. Foop. George, Harold, and the waistband warrior floated down safely as the spaceship above them exploded. Kaboom! Hallelujah! cried Harold. We're not gonna die! We're not gonna die! Or, said George, maybe we are. Chapter 21 The Deliriously Dangerous Death-Defying Dandelion of Doom George, Harold, and Captain Underpants floated downward, directly into the waiting jaws of the Dandelion of Doom. <laughs> oh man, cried Harold. We could have gotten killed in a cool, exploding spaceship. But instead, we're gonna get eaten by a dandelion. Yeah, George moaned. People are going to be giggling at our funerals. The dandelion munched Captain Underpants and swung George and Harold around like a couple of rag dolls. The two boys flew off and landed on the roof of the school. Help me! Screamed Captain Underpants as the dandelion of doom swung him back and forth. What should we do? cried Harold. I've got an idea, said George. It's a bad idea, and I know we're going to regret it, but we've got to act fast. The fate of the entire planet is in our hands. The next time the giant evil dandelion lurched toward the boys, George poured some extra strength superpower juice into Captain Underpants' mouth. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen now? asked Harold. I don't know, said George but I have a feeling it's going to involve incredibly graphic violence. Chapter 22 The Incredibly Graphic Violence Chapter, Part 2 In, in sound, sound o -rama. O rama Register trademark. Warning! The following chapter contains scenes of a very unpleasant nature. All nastiness was performed by a qualified stuntman and a licensed stunt plant. Do not attempt to battle giant evil dandelions at home, even if you have recently consumed extra strength superpower juice. Such behavior could result in serious boo-boos. The National Board of Boo-Boo Prevention. <laughs> when dandelions attack! <laughs> Tra -la -la. Stop that! Oh. Ooh. Why, I Weed Whacker! Uh, Tra -la -la. Yeah. Ouch! Hey! Ooh. Yikes! Oh. Hey! Yeah. Ouch! 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 Hooray for Captain Underpants! Ooh. Hey! Stop that! Tra -la -la. Chapter 23, the 23rd chapter. Captain Underpants, with the help of his newly developed superpowers, had defeated the deliriously dangerous, death-defying Dandelion of Doom. Now the only thing left to do was to stop the evil zombie nerds. Oh, how are we going to conquer the evil zombie nerds? asked George. How will we ever change them back to normal? Well. We could try this anti-evil zombie nerd juice, said Harold. George rolled his eyes. I was hoping for something a little more dramatic, he said. But we're running out of pages. Let's do it. So Harold mixed up a batch of anti-evil zombie nerd root beer and ordered everybody in the school to drink some. The evil zombie nerds lined up. Must drink root beer. They moaned, Must drink root beer. When the last zombie nerd had swallowed his last sip of root beer, 
George ordered Captain Underpants to get dressed back up like Mr. Krupp. But I'll lose my superpowers if I put on clothing, said Captain Underpants. The power of underwear must be... Just put the clothes on, bub, George instructed. Captain Underpants did as he was told, and then George poured water over the hero's head. Now all we can do is wait, said Harold. Wait and hope that everybody returns to normal. I like pickles. Chapter 24. To make a long story short, they did. Chapter 25. Back to normal? Hooray! said Harold. It's great to have everybody back to normal. Yep, said George. That's for sure. But back to normal probably wasn't the best choice of words. For while the students and faculty were the same as they'd always been, something had definitely changed about Mr. Krupp. Because from that day on, Whenever he heard the sounds of fingers snapping, snap, Mr. Krupp not only turned back into you-know-who, but he also had extra-strength superpowers. And if you thought it was hard for George and Harold to keep up with him before, well, snap, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, no! Screamed Harold. Here we go again! Screamed George. Tra la la Hey! I'm flying! Whee! The End